I think that microphone. You know. Okay, good. Because I don't want to take it. Um, guys, welcome to class. I've already asked a couple of you guys what you're here to learn. Somebody said, uh, uh, in the corner? Trevor. Yeah. Trevor wants to learn everything. So he's kind of the right spot. Anybody else have any, anything that they're specifically looking for so that I can at least touch touch on it briefly throughout the, the, the uh, topic of conversation? Because we've got this this presentation is going to be very picky. Um, Detailed, it's going to be a uh, high level. Um, it's going to cover a lot of uh, content. Um, but if there's something specifically you guys want to hear, either during the presentation or you just tell me right now, just let me know and we can talk about it um, as the topic is um, covered. Another thing, if, you, if I say something you don't understand what the word is or what is he talking about, this guy speaking some foreign language. Stop me right there and say, hey, what does that mean? I don't know what the stratification means. What does that actually, what does that mean? Just whatever the question might be. So this is going to be a more conversational type of a presentation uh, rather than. Um, <coughs> First, we're going to go over this applicable test types. Um, this is the stat test that we do as in, we'll get to it, but it's just the, the type of testing that we do as an emission test. And we're pretty, we're, Pretty niche, niche, as in we were pretty much um, midstream natural gas and best compressor engines. Uh, we're going to talk about the 2014 revocation of, uh, of alt methods 061 and 087 that has to do with uh, single point testing. We're going to go through um, this 2016 update to the FAQ uh, section of method 19 that has to do with the calculation of. Exhaust flow using a measured fuel rate. Probe selection sample point location. This is method one, method two. Um, did basically different types of probes that you're going to be using for the different types of stacks and proper configuration for flow disturbances. Um, and then stack configuration issues. Um, we'll get to that. You'll see that not all stacks are configured properly or equally. Um, some updates to. Uh, R1, or R reference method 2 and reference method 7E. Uh, and then the final icing on the cake is going to be FTIR analysis. And this is the most exciting thing you guys are going to want. You're going to love it. It's so intense, excellent. It's going to be, you guys are probably going to give me a standing ovation at the end of this after you hear this entire presentation. This part's awesome. So let's jump right in. Um, I've not done a presentation uh, since college, so I'm not very comfortable using um, Quick little test types. You've got Quad J. This, most of this is for stationary rice engines, um, except for the subpart Quad I uh, and Quad K. Subpart Quad I has to do with diesel engines. Quad K is with turbines. Um, all of these are primarily other than the diesel Quad I. They're, they're um, natural gas burning, um, super clean, as we all know. And then, of course, there's other uh, state required testing in, in the Texas that require initial tests over 500 horsepower. Uh, and then, of course, you get more restricted areas like the non attaining areas, like in um, 117 counties, the DFW, et cetera, where you have to test smaller horsepower engines. But it's just different types of tests that we currently do as a company. Um, and so, this right here, we're already digging in, digging in deep already. Um, Alternate methods 061 and 087. So basically, this is some language uh, that, that is included within the um, revocation of the methods. But so if we actually go back here, in Alaska, they've done, they've done some research and they published this paper and they said, hey, cannot use just a shepherd's hook to test an engine. Because prior to 2014, you could just literally throw a shepherd's hook over the stack. You didn't have to worry about flow disturbance criteria. You have to worry about stratification as in, is my exhaust thoroughly mixed? It was presumed it was already thoroughly mixed because of the catalyst, because of this just the general high flow nature of, of um, compressor engine exhaust. But in 2014, they said, hey, we can't do that anymore because if you go back here, they're saying, okay, it should be thoroughly mixed. And they said less than four inches is exempt, and which it still is. After this, now you say it's over four inches, and it's a state test. You have to say, okay, now I have to do stratification again. You're like, what does that mean? Get to that in a second. This is more language with regard to um, 
them disallowing the single point testing. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is the, the, the bare bones of, of flow disturbance criteria. How are things how is flow disturbance right here? What is a disturbance? What is what, what is a flow disturbance? Where is a proper place to sample from? Where is a good place for a port location to be? And, and, the, and the gist of it is any um, contraction of pipe, any bend in pipe, um, or any expansion in pipe. Come on in, you're more than welcome. Um, so essentially, the, the, the rule of thumb is from a downstream disturbance, you have to have two stack diameters of distance. So if we'll say this is 12 inches, you say this is a 12 inch stack, stack diameter, you have to at least be 24 inches right here. And it's also from the upstream disturbance, where that's downstream, sorry, downstream disturbance, uh, you have to have a half stack diameter. So if it's a 12 inch stack, you have six inches uh, from the end of the stack. So if these would, if in that situation, this is the uh, stack that's configured properly for sample. But just because it's configured properly for sampling doesn't mean you have to do a stratification test. Because when all, the alt method was revoked, <clears throat> alt, alt method was revoked, those alt methods were revoked, pardon me. It disallowed just saying, hey, this is not stratified. Now you have to check to make sure it's stratified or not. And the stratification check that we're talking about is the stratification check for method seven. <laughs> States, uh, let's see. Well, this is the, the language. Okay, this is right here. So basically, what it says here is you're supposed to test at 16.7, uh, 50%, and 83.3% of the stack diameter. So you're moving across the stack. Either you're going to test that 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 20 minutes here, or it says here that you can. What you're supposed to do for the stratification check is for the minimum sample time for that is two times the response time. The response time is, is, is gathered during your system calibration for oxygen, for NOx, to, to 3A calculation, or 3A measurement, 7E measurement, or method 10. So if you're using any of those methods, then you have to do this to make sure that your, your passes are not stratified. So you're supposed to measure at each of those points at the 16.7, 50%, and 83.3% for literally double that response time. And, and, and again, you get that response time when you're running a calibration gas through your entire system to see, okay, how long did it take? Is it one minute? Is it 30 seconds? So then at that point, um, two times that response time is the amount of time you have to collect each gas or collect from the sample from the effluent gas stream. Um, and along these same lines, um, there's different criteria here that, that state whether or not it's stratified, minimally stratified, or not stratified. And, and the criteria is pretty clear. To for, for a concentration to not be stratified, you have to have no more than a 5% mean a, a concentration difference, plus or minus 5% mean concentration difference, which is pretty easy to do in most natural gas uh, engines or um, Turbines or anything like that. And honestly, to, to date, we've tested, I don't know how many thousands of these engines. We've never come across an issue. And it's just the data is what the data is. It just it just proves that in fact it's a catalyst. And it is in it, in it irrespective of the flow disturbances, irrespective of the incorrect stack configurations, we're not seeing any stratification. Either way, it still has to be done per um, the method. Um, yeah, sir, you, you do that at different loads. It's at whatever the load is of the engine you're testing. So yeah, it's, it's typically as found condition. Um, of course, there's a lot of people that say, hey, I want something at 90% load, or I want to take something off to get the load up, but it's, I mean, you're doing that for, I mean, if you're not running that like that on a regular basis, there's no, no sense there. But even, even in light of that, we've seen engines loaded as light as 20% and as high as over 100%, slightly over 100%, and it's always good. The only thing that we do see on, on, the, on, the, on a different side of things that shows that is stratified is a uh, our Richford engine. Because with the Richford engine, um, 
can't use oxygen as an, as an analyte. Otherwise, you can use, for any lean burner, you can just use oxygen as analyte. And for doing this in the lean burner combustion, it's oxygen is in the solid the whole time. So you're having zero with a variability of the oxygen. With the rich burner, it's zero, so you can't divide by zero, it's still zero. It doesn't work. So <clears throat> you choose other analytes. And one thing that we have noticed is over time that it appears there's some stratification, but it's not the stra it's not stratification, it's only the variability. You're looking at AFR, it's not able to keep up with, with the proper NOx or the proper CO levels, and you're seeing some variability that what it's just a bunch of fluctuation. So it gives you a false sense that it's stratified, but again, in the minimum time is two times. So you can collect more data. So this is what we have to do to prove that it's not, not stratified is you just collect a garbage load of strat data. You have five minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes there. So you're saying you can go across and do a point one and it says X and the two it says Y. So if you were at X at already, you would be Y as well. Wait, say it again. So you're it's, saying that it's it's only varying because the whole stack is varying. Correct. It's, 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 and by the time you move to the second point, every, the whole stack has changed. Correct. Okay. So we're saying that, so theoretically, yes. Yeah. So what we're saying is if you can test all three. If you can test all three, and that's what we're gonna talk about here in a second. Um, but yeah, so what we're saying is there's no real variability as far as there is some pressure variability, but we're not measuring pressure. Yeah. It's a fluke concentration. Data show gratification. Not in reality. Can you redo the stratification test on the That was stratified. You can do it as many times as you want, as long as you can say what, what that is what. It's kind of, it's kind of, well, it's kind of silly because yeah. we've got some guys that are in like, you know, West Texas or whatever, you've got a uh, bad uh, fuel quality, you've got issues, uh, and you're like, man, dude, this thing's, this is so stratified. And you're like, it's not stratified, man, just like more data. And then you've got some end up having like 20 or 30 minutes worth of data, and you just, okay, let's stratify some averages here. It mean at least that that two times response. And our our typical system response times are anywhere between like nine and thirty seconds. So we have ours just set to do about two minutes of strata, just because this makes it uniform across the board. <coughs> Excuse me. So if your if your concentration is not stratified, you can you're, you're supposed to sample at the point. Where is it here? That most closely that most closely matches the mean. So you so basically you go through, you plug all your data in, and then at the end of it, okay, here's here's a, a good this is a good stratification test that we did here where we sampled at one, two, and three, so 16.7, 15, 83.3. There's a bunch of other data here that doesn't really make that much difference. But what we're looking at here is this mean concentration difference. So the one that's the closest would be point 0.1. So if you want to sample at the correct location, you would sample from point 0.1 because you're looking at negative 0.66. So as long as we were plus or minus this 5% right here, which is 6.9 for, I mean, 6.9 ppm, you can see we're clearly at least. So definitely not stratified. But going back over here, um, if you are greater, if you're, where is the, so if you're plus or minus 10% of the mean, the, the gas concentration is minimally stratified. So then you have to take your samples from three points, those three points that we previously mentioned, 16.7, 50, and 83.3%, um, and you just do 20 minutes. Who's getting tired? Who's tired? Do we need to stand up? Anybody need to stand up? Do a stretch. Are you guys good? Okay. I know this is this is some rough stuff. This is and we haven't even gotten anywhere in this presentation. This is like this is very good. We're even like two slides in, we're like fifty. I think. How many slides are there? Is it fifty? It's like a ton of slides. Um, fifty-five. <laughs> what number am I on? Yeah. Okay, we're getting through it, guys. We're only getting through this. If anybody has any questions, again, like feel free to ask them as I'm going through. So then, at that point, you have to. It's minimally starting if it's plus or minus. Uh, if it's within that plus or minus, if it's greater than the five percent um, difference or between that 10% plus or minus. Um, and then if it is um, greater than that, it's 10th, you have to, if it's, oh, it's cut off. Uh, that's fine. Um, 
So if it's greater than that 10 percent, is there a way to zoom that out or whatever? No. Sorry. I guess we're never gonna be able to read that. So sad. It's right here. Do um, you want me to read it? No, it's fine. So if it's greater, if it's greater than that 10 percent, then it, the yes, the equity yes is stratified, meaning that it's not thoroughly mixed. And for our, for all, all intents and purposes, we never deal with that, so it's mostly irrelevant. But if you want to make sure you're doing it the correct way, then at that point, you measure at the 12 traverse points uh, per method one. You back in, all the way back to method one that says, hey, what are we measuring? And then I'm sure if you're like, what are these 12 points? How do you come up with these 12 points? It's equal area method. Um, voila. So what you're doing is you're literally moving, and this is this is when it becomes quite cumbersome, time consuming, and this is where you start spending a lot of time at the stack and people. But luckily, we we don't have to do this because we don't ever have gratified gas. So all of our all of our concentrates are thoroughly mixed. It's fantastic. But either way, if you did, you literally have to have two points, two two uh, uh, portholes, one going this way and, and one perpendicular to it to get both sets going across. You you'd have to mark your probe at each of these specific diameter ratings based off of the personal injury. Got that in the later slide. Uh, you can use well. You can use the, that's so if it's, if it's stratified, you cannot do that. But you can use a, a multi-rate probe in situations where it's not stratified or it's it's um, minimally stratified. There's there's been some technical reviews with different states that would say if you're putting a multi-rate probe in. Uh, and sampling without doing some sort of initial stratification check. How do you know you're meeting the less than five percent criteria or five to ten percent? You know, it's it's a you're assuming a lot. Now, quad J regulations and quad Z regulations, for example, say that you you're allowed to use that type of probe, but um, any administrative agency could you know at, at at their discretion say we don't like that unless yeah, you can I prove mean, basically it's like is it is it stratified or not you know i presume it's not and of course we can say we can presume that the engines are stratified but to the point that randy just made if the state regulatory office if michael the tcq gets the report and is like wait what's this no strat check and it's over four inches i don't believe you i want to see some data and then at that point he says hey this this test is invalid because you don't you have done proper methodology for Making sure that you're uh, in compliance with verification requirements. I don't know if that's your job. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, now now this is where everyone's going to really like this stuff. This is really cool. You're, everyone's like, oh, what is this reference method to? What's reference method 19? Does anybody know? Does anybody want to answer? Anyone? 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 Okay. Um, so reference method two is what we're just talking about, basically. It's very similar to what we're talking about. So we're going to be doing pollutant stratification. This other test actually measures measures different pore pressure, um, but it's, you're at the same part, like the same point at the stack. You're using the same exact port holes, but instead of using your um, sampling line, you're using a um, either some sort of a pitot, as in a standard pitot. Or a S type pedo, and you're and you're doing your pressure measurements across the exhaust. Because you're me measuring the differential pressure, which with this really ridiculously complicated formula, you can be able to convert that pressure measurement into a pounds per hour, and say for example, per horsepower or whatever unit you're trying to uh, use for mass emission rate. But the thing with the measure uh, with the reference method two is it measures quantifiable velocity that you're getting from the exhaust. Um, so you're you're measuring the exhaust flow difference with method 19. You're calculating the exhaust flow, but to calculate the exhaust flow, you have to have a measured measured fuel source. You have to have a measured, as in you have to have a certified fuel meter for the source. You can't have a, a, a fuel meter for the station, or you have 10 engines and everything's loaded differently. You can't say, oh, I can divide that by this or whatever. You can't do that. You can't use uh, manufacturer specifications is you have to have a dedicated fuel meter for this uh, as well as a gas analysis. 
because it uses F factors and all kinds of other stuff that it's um, probably not going to be gotten into. How As I mentioned, um, it requires a dedicated fuel meter. If you don't have a dedicated fuel meter, you cannot do method 19. I don't care who you are, where you are, it doesn't matter, it's not valid. So if you see someone sends a report to you that says, hey, use reference method 19, and you don't have a, a fuel meter calibration in there, and it's, it's and the fuel meters can be calibrated per the operator's uh, uh, guidance. If the operators say we calibrate our fuel meters semi annually or annually or quarterly or whatever, as long as there's some sort of procedure in place and those procedures are being invited by, that's fine. Um, you can also use an insertable type of uh, fuel meter. We have we have those, we have that we're used to using more often here at Bayer, but we, we since we have bucket trucks, it's just easier for us to get. Because to to use the uh, insertion type fuel meter, you have to have specific um, similar flow disturbance pressure to be met with. They put ball valves in, and then it's, I mean, you're, it's just kind of a nightmare. Plus, you also have to calibrate those, which is a pain in the butt. So um, you can use insertion type, or you can eat, um, or dedicated fuel meter. And also, the other thing is, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, you, one thing you cannot do is you can't. Use um, cannot use manufacturer's data, but if, if you've got all this other data, you can totally use it. There's a link down here uh, to the FAQ section that if you guys can some presentation, that we'll reach out to if you have any more questions on with regard to this 19. These are the two pedos that we use, or two, two pedo types. Uh, oops, easy. So you have the standard pedo here. Standard pedo is for anything up to about a 12 inch exhaust um, and for anything over 12 inches UCS type. And for to use any of these properly, you have to have port holes, you have to have the flow distance right here to do that and all these other shenanigans and all those kind of things. But we'll that in a minute. Um, oh, here's a little video that I've seen here. Oh, we missed out the last point. There, there's supposed to be a point here. I don't know why I paused out. But okay, so this is a, a little video that we put together. Put that on LinkedIn. So again, don't follow us on LinkedIn. Go follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we put up content like this on a regular basis. Little short, informative videos that we like. We also that if you can tell, that was Randy's wonderful voice doing the voiceover. It's fantastic. He's really good at it. Only mild editing on his voice because uh, he's almost a little higher pitch than that, but it's okay. Um, so this shows the different. Um, Percentages of stack that you have to measure at for the pressure of the tube for exhaust flow. So literally, you have to mark your probe. And you can see right here the inches on diameter here, and then the percentages here. We have templates we've built. So if it's a 12 inch stack, or if it's an 8 inch stack, or whatever the stack size is. And well, there's also some combination of points. We're not going to get to that here, but like if you just look at this, you're like, okay, so this is where you have to be sampling. So you literally have to mark your probe. Insert the probe, measure, get your reading. We have digital manometers that we use to measure. We use millibars because it's a smaller um, unit than um, inches of water. It's easily converted. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I guess that's it. Um, it's annoying you. Uh, I said, uh, so you have to mark your probe and you have to measure at each of these spots across the stack, one way and then the other way. And that's required. I mean, it's no getting around it. So it takes some time up at the stack to do this because you're talking about measuring at a specific point, getting that, giving a number. We also have our, our uh, manometers are digitally recordable as well. So we, have, we also have the digital footprint that auto records. So you're literally moving across the stack both ways. And at some points, and sometimes, you can see that there's a port hole right there, a port right there. And you can't see the one on the back side. But one of the some issues we have is, is there are misconfigured stacks where you get the Port on this side and the other port over the uh, exhaust itself, and that's just dangerous. So in those situations, it's, I mean, you have to make the judgment call, can you reach it, or is it too dangerous to do so? Uh, 
on site issues. This is a biggie and I, I'm sure that and I know most of the stuff is stuff that we care about, which if you're an operator, you should care about it as well, because if you see look, if you see compressor engines or turbines or any sources that require any type of regular testing that don't have um, proper uh, scaffolding and ladders, if you don't have a proper rail catwalks. Um, and it's just it just causes issues for the people that are trying to go out there and do the job for for whoever it might be, or no or no test ports. And then the other thing is, of course, non-compliant stacks. As in, there's no ports. It's just an elbow that comes out. It's just a slice coming off of the side of it where there's there's no way at all to even do any type of pressure measurement, or to make compliance with that two and half stack diameter requirement for for sampling in general. Anyway, there's a way around that. We'll get to that in a second. Oh, here's another little video. This example. So this is just an example of just a couple stacks that we've come across in the few days since we started taking pictures. So we've started taking pictures of stacks because we had some clients say, hey, how come I don't have, how come this report like looks like this and how come this report looks like this? Why is this going to show um, eight point? Oops, dang it. That's fine. How come this one shows more more um, stratification uh, points for not stratification but pressure measurements across the stack? How come this one looks different than this? And why this? Why that? It's like it's because the, you guys still meet flow distribution criteria. So we've, we've worked with the TC2 and actually ran on site during this test with was it Drew Spiegel on this one? Drew. Yep. With Drew Spiegel from the TC2, and he says, "Hey man, uh, I don't have any ports, man. How am I supposed to? How am I supposed to?" To do my uh, strap and my, my pressure readings. I'm supposed to do that. Now, what, what do you guys think? And they took the idea of saying, hey, we will let you guys just go ahead and do. Oh, also, this is a dual stack too. So that's, an, that's a whole separate issue. So, dual stack engines, uh, they've recommended that you test them simultaneously, but that's pretty difficult to do unless you have mul multiple labs, et cetera, or mul at least multiple pressure readings, which is also difficult to do because if you have one person with one, with two arms, I don't know how you're going to do all that at once. But uh, th they came up with the agreement that we could do a 40 point traverse if it didn't meet um, flow service criteria. And it's, there's some loose language within um, reference method one that states something similar to that. But essentially, it's just a ridiculous number 20 points this way, 20 points that way of flow measurements. Which again takes a, a lot of time, and especially with some of these engines during the middle of the summer. It's, it's Quite onerous and dangerous. Um, <clears throat> there's some more examples of of some stacks that are configured improperly. We did not use this for sampling. We don't typically use drop down lines and things like that because the FJR we use FJR primarily for every type of test that we do do, um, and that's because it's rugged, it's repeatable, it's super accurate, and essentially the calibrations you do with the FJR they're not calibrations. You're never having to adjust anything. It's just like, is it in good health? Then if it is in good health, then you're, all your calibrations pass. Period. Period. It's like they're not if ands or buts. It's the gold standard. Um, oh, then again, this is a properly configured stack. You can see the port here. You see that one right there. So you can tell that this is the proper disturbance criteria here, uh, half stack diameter, and then this is greater than two stacks. So that's good to go um, for sampling. Uh, we've talked about the probe selection earlier. S type pedo for anything larger. Typically, the S type pedo is going to have a sheath uh, around it. It's typically a two inch uh, pipe thread. And um, actually, one, one thing that we do come across is our engines that have either the, the port plug stuck in there because when they put the engines, when they build the engine, the build the exhaust, it's cold, which metal expands. Or once the metal heats up, it expands, thus. You have locked in port plugs. So in some situations, you might have a stack that's configured properly, but you still can't use the plug because because it's stuck. I mean, we've got impact wrenches, we've got hammers, we've got cheater bars, we've got everything you could think of to try to get these things out. And it, 
Honestly, I've never, I will say this, I've never come across a plug I've not been able to remove after at least an hour of work. I mean, you're talking some serious work, but you can get it out eventually. Sometimes, but another situation is not even happening. Well, I've never come across one personally, but it's been a number of years since I've had to test or was fortunate enough to test. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is like, you see, if you see this right here, this is not a, stand, or a, a standard pedo. This is just a configured pipe that we've used in, in case we did not meet flow service criteria so that we could exactly like it. So if you have enough length, but there's no, no port holes anywhere, you can still least sample from the proper locations for flow disturbance. Because you'd be sampling, so this would be however many inches that is, that's would be the sampling location at that point. Ah, the three point long line. Who brought that up earlier? The three points. So this is the three point long line and there's very specific requirements for the three point long line. I think that's in 25A, is that right? Uh, I think it's 25A. There's a guidance document. It, there's. It's EPA guidance document 031, if I'm not mistaken, criteria for multi rake probes and how to uh, certify them and the, calibrate them. The, the, yeah, specific requirements for, for certifying and calibrating. It's a flow measure test. It's not a pollutant concentration or anything like that. You have to measure with um, calibrated rotometers at each point to make sure that the flow is a plus or minus uh, a certain percentage. And also the deck. Oh, but this is an example of, of one of those calibrations. Um, we have we have, a, we have a couple of these probes in the house. We don't we very rarely use them because we strat test everything. We check pollutant stratification on everything. And again, it's never stratified from what we've seen, but we still do it just in case because it's better to do it and invest that five to ten minutes worth of time rather than risk uh, our client having a report. <coughs> There's specific diameter requirements for uh, the holes to be drilled. We're not getting into that. You guys don't care about how uh, rig probes are configured and that kind of stuff. It's, it's a little too detailed, I'd say, for you guys, unless you want to hear about it. I can tell you, I can't remember what the millimeter is, but I can look it up and take two seconds. Um, again, this, this is a great example of almost like a shepherd's hook type of a configuration where you're still able to, con so this is a, a stack that would be an example of something that's not configured properly. As in, no portholes, no nothing. How are you going to access the proper sampling location? But you could actually use the rake probe and have it extended down in with, with some piping and have it situated and clamped up top to make sure that it is, in fact, meeting flow disturbance criteria. So at least at that point, you're sampling at a good location. Um, we've got, so in this in this situation, we would, unless this was, we might be able to get some pressure readings with our, our standard pitot over the top. If and have it meet flow disturbance criteria, if the stack is small enough. But the standard pedo drop down on it's about uh, six to eight inches. So you're, it's, if anything's greater than twelve inches, and you're using that standard pedo. You're not going to be able to meet that proper flow disturbance criteria. So you're going to have to measure multiple. Which again, we've gotten clears from the TCQ to do that in the past. Not desirable, um, and if, it, if we come across stacks like that, that uh, and so you saw those pictures, we come across stacks that look bad and tell the client, hey, this looks bad, and also this test can be rejected by the TCQ. They can say, hey, this doesn't meet flood disturbance criteria. And if you go way back to that first little slide that we saw earlier, in the, when Randy's doing his voiceover about the, the, the stacks, it's, it's the requirement of the operator to make sure it's, it's, it's in bold letters, and it's the first note in reference method one. It says it's required at least Exhausts are configured properly for proper testing. Um, here's some great examples of horrible ways to test. This is a shepherd's hook just thrown over the side. This we've got this mock stack that we've built. It's got a little fan that uh, it's, it's for our guys to practice because practicing in the field's fun and cool, but it's really difficult to do hands-on training when the guy's 25 feet up in the air. So we've built these stacks so we're able to actually do the training in-house in the controlled environment with the AC blasting on us, so we're not uh, out in the middle of nowhere um, doing all that stuff. Okay, so this, again, the revocation of alt method 061, 061 and 087 says you cannot do this. You can't, so if you see somebody out testing and, you, and they've got a shepherd's hook um, hanging over the side of the stack, one, there's issues with moisture dropping out of the sample, and that's only an issue 
Uh, actually, it's always an issue if because if the sample gets below the dew point of water, isn't it? If your sample can condense, it will literally strip out your NO2. And we've seen that like with the FTIR, it is such a great piece of equipment that you can actually see moisture spikes because the water's collecting. And when those droplets hit the gas cell, which is at 191 degrees Celsius or about 375 degrees, it vaporizes it. And your NO2 goes into the trash. It's gone. It's like 30 ppm, zero, and then your moisture spikes. It's like a direct offset. It's pretty, pretty interesting uh, to actually see it on. And but the, another thing is, we won't get into it, but it damages the FTR. It's, it's, a, bad, it's a bad idea. So like, we do not use drop lines. We don't use shepherd soaks, if at all possible. We, we do our best to use port, proper portholes. And if we have to, go over the top with some sort of uh, different type of configured uh, probe that will do our best to meet uh, flow disturbance criteria and keep the clients out of trouble. Um, <clears throat> what is this? Oh, I should have taken this out. That's fine. Um, this is an example of a drop line. It's the same situation. You're talking exposed sampling lines. Uh, this is stainless steel typically. You'll see this on many locations. It, some uh, compressor engine companies, maintenance companies, etc., will use those to do their, their core lead emissions checks. We don't do that. Um, because again, how do you know if it's stratified? How do you know anything about the the concentrations of of the um, or or anything about the stack at that point? Um, this is the proper way of doing it. This is an S-type pedo inserted, and if you see here, this is the sample line right there. This is a thermocouple, and these are the pressure. This is the impact pedo, and this is the static pedo measuring the differential pressure. And the way that this works is this is. This gets you every bit of information that you need to calculate your exhaust flow or to measure exhaust flow properly. Because one of the main points is you have to have temperature, you have to have pressure, you have to have proper diameter measured. And that was one of, one of the struggles that we've had uh, at this point is people not being able to measure things properly. Like this is the easiest thing about what we do, but it's the most errant thing that we've come across here in the most recent days. It's kind of interesting. But that's where we're also taking pictures. That's where we're also doing all this other extra stuff just to make sure that that everyone is doing everything properly because you cannot uh, QA that if you don't have a picture or you don't have some sort of data. Um, let's see here. So right here, this is uh, reference method two. Uh, table two says there was there was a, at some point some some questioning as to when you need to measure exhaust flow. So some, you just need to measure your exhaust flow once per run. Um, reference method 7E updates. 7E is the, is the standard to which many of these test methods have been built and, and designed off of. As in, they just say, look at 7E, look at 7E. So if you say, what do I need to, what method is for oxygen? It's method 3A. Reference method 3A look, says, look at 7E. If you look at Reference method 10 for CO, look at 70. So whenever we talk about method 70, so if you're measuring oxygen, so if you're testing any type of source, I would say you're probably measuring oxygen as well. There may not be any, there might be an absence of oxygen, but you still have to calibrate your oxygen analyzer for that. Um, so this is this is the big thing that a lot of people have missed. And when did this come out? This was like 2015, 16, 17? What's up? The um Post run. Uh, that was at the uh, December 7th, 2020. 2020? Yeah, EPA said you've got to do your bias checks after each test run. So previously, you were allowed to take your risk. We had it in our template where it's like, you want to risk it, you want to risk it. But the thing is, the oxygen analyzer, it's not risking anything because it's very repeatable as well. So it's like, oh, are we going to risk it, man? Because you can do as many tests as your pre calibrations in the morning. You can do 100 tests throughout the day, and then end of the day, do your post test. You're like, if you pass that post calibration, you're good to go. So that is no longer possible, guys. You cannot do that. So if you see a test report come across your, your desk, and you have more than one run, and you don't see post calibrations, and if it's a state or EPA or at least something that's not a poorly typed test, and you're not seeing a post run oxygen calibration, say red flags, red flags, this test is not valid. Anybody need to stand up, do some stretching? At the end of this, we'll be doing hot yoga. If anyone's interested, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Okay. This, okay. Everyone should probably stand up right now because this is going to be tough. <laughs> this is going to be some tough stuff. Stretch your legs. We're going to do some deep knee bends. Coffee? <laughs> oh, yeah. Feel free to get up, get some coffee, and come on back. That's fine. Maybe Randy will run and get it for you. Randy, we'll take an order for coffee. <laughs> um, all right. So this is. So if, if using the FTIR, which we pretty much predominantly use FTIR for all analyte measuring. One, because you can measure so many different things. Like you can measure up to 250 different analytes. So we don't even know anything about like oh, why does it have all this in there? I don't know. It's just part of one of the setups of the analyzers. At one point in time, we were actually outsourcing a quick side note, uh, quite quick side story. Um, a few years ago, where I was out testing an engine in the, in the uh, Oklahoma Panhandle. Engines swinging all over the place, all kinds of crazy nonsense. And this is actually going to come back to at this the manual validation portion of this. The manual validation portion is is we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. But I'm testing this engine, and it's going CO is going crazy, NOx is going crazy, CO is going crazy, NOx is going crazy. Everything's passing, but it's just really wildly fluctuating. It was a gas lift engine. I had no idea what was going on. We send the data off at that point in time to a third party. Um, Data validation company that actually trained us how to do everything we currently do do, and have helped us become subject matter experts with, with regard to FTR use and testing. Anyhow, I sent him this test, this, this this test. I uploaded it. He picks up the phone and calls me. And says, "You're alive," and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm alive. What do you mean? What do you, why would I not be alive?" He's like, "I did the validation on that," and I was like, "I was looking at the CO and the spectrum, and I was just like, this isn't CO. This looks like CO, but it's not CO." What was it? It was cyanide. Somehow had some spike of like 2,800, or no, sorry, 20,000 ppm of cyanide. It was coming across this carbon monoxide. So he was able to just do this picket fencing and take that out and say, okay, this is actually what the CO was. And it was interesting that I was like, well, that's crazy. So I said, how do I see if I've been around more cyanide? He says, you can reprocess the data. Great thing about this FTR that it's not just a table, it's not just some CSV file, it's not just some Excel garbage thing that pops out, it's like, like a typewriter. Oh, this is that. No, this is a literal infrared spectrum fingerprint of a snapshot in time, and it is amazing. It's like it's one of the coolest things ever. I said, Oh, did you guys test for formaldehyde on this engine? Well, we didn't, but we can reprocess it and add formaldehyde. And you want to see methanol? We can add methanol, see propylene, we see propylene, we see propane, all that stuff. It's amazing. It's a, it's a very robust piece of equipment. It's freaking awesome. Um, we've also been asked here recently from everybody, and methane is a huge topic all of a sudden. For the past two years, everyone's like, methane this, methane that. What's my methane on this? And so we're able to reprocess the data and harvest based off of one of the exhaust flow rates we already have. And two, the PPM measurements of, of, of methane and say, this is your pounds per hour, this is your tons per hour, this is your grams, whatever you want. It's just such a tremendously awesome piece of equipment. <laughs> um, we're going to go through a couple of different things in this portion. Sorry, that those are the. How much time do I have? I'm running out of time. You got 45 minutes. Keep asking questions during the presentation because I don't think we're going to have enough time. Um, we should get through this stuff. Um, we'll speed it up and put it hyper mode. Um, recipe, so we're going to go through a couple different things. Recipe and method building, um, on site field analysis, this is procedures. As we go through this year, you guys will be like, oh, this, this doesn't make sense or it doesn't make sense. But I don't know. We'll see. Um, post test data validation, and then some common uh, ASTM method things that we've seen um, other people do or not do. So the, the, one of the main things with this FTIR D6348 method is eight annexes. So the method says you have to do all eight annexes. You're like, what is this annex? Okay, so this is, so test plan requirements, determination, and some of this stuff is done by the manufacturer, and some of it is done in the field, and some of it's done in the office afterwards. Um, and We'll go through each one of these. You talk about reference spectra, required pretest procedures, the analyte spike, which is cool um, if you're a nerd. Um, determining system performance, that's easy stuff. And then this is definitely not prepared by us. This is from the from the manufacturer uh, of the analyzer. We use MKS 2030 um, 
instruments, uh, they're super high res. Uh, you have to use liquid nitrogen to cool the optics detector so you get a good picture. And if you're if you're not paying attention throughout a long day, you might actually lose signal and you'll say, oh my goodness, I don't have anything but it says NAN, which means not a number, which means you just wasted some time. Because you have to pour more liquid nitrogen in to cool the detector down. Um, <coughs> So this is uh, Annex 3. This is the stuff that we do before we get in the field. It's, um, and this is done by the manufacturer where you just basically load in a natural gas method. It's 191C. It's this, the standard that everybody uses for stack testing. Um, you could buy it, but our, ours is, is given to us by MKS. Um, the algorithm is what you're actually double checking against with the manual validation. And I think I put in a video of a quick time-lapse version of the manual validation, which is required per Annex 8. Oh, one thing I'll also mention back over here. So if you actually get into Quad J and you look at um, one, of the, one of the tables in there, it'll actually say that you have to follow or report Annexes 1 through 7. It says report Annex 1 through 7. But if you don't perform all Annexes, you do not perform the method. So if you just report one through seven, but you still don't do Annex eight, did you really complete the report? Did you really complete the test? Did you really, um, is it a valid test? And our contention is no, because if you don't do that, if you don't know if your manual quantification is good, how do you know that the data is good? How do you know that you're not looking at cyanide instead of CO? How do you know what you're really looking at unless you do the manual validation? And what that does, it compares with the human eye what we see is as a PPM number to that algorithm. Because the algorithm, yes, is pretty well and true and pretty accurate for, for the for the combustion of natural gas, but is not always 100 percent correct. And we found that out, of course, with my cyanide example, because otherwise you reported some ridiculous number of, of CO, which wasn't there. And the question is. Does it happen all the time? No, but it happens enough to merit doing it. And also, if you're saying you're doing a method, you have to do the method. Whether or not you report it or not, it's a different story and irrelevant. But as long as everything's complete and within the report, you have your annex one through eight, you're good to go. And if you could say, hey, uh, Bear, can you send me a copy of this uh, manual validation or whatever? We'll say, yeah, absolutely. That's already in the report. But for somebody else, it may not be doing enough. That manual validation. So, like you talked about, well, hey, we pull that cyanide number. Yeah. You do the manual validation <laughs> after the fact. You say, oh yeah, ten days later, I need cyanide. Sure. That's okay. So you, so we we house the data forever, pretty much. So we need to have a record spectra from any test report from anything. Well, the manual validation is not the reprocessing. It's it's a different thing. So the manual validation is double checking the algorithm versus uh, the human eye. And that's what's called manual validation. There's some people who use this thing called the ADU, which is the automated um, validation utility. Val validation utility, it's not the same thing either, it's just automated, it's not manual. So it doesn't make sense. But it does, it does do some things, it checks the health of the instrument, it checks pressures, it checks temperatures, because all this algorithm is doing, it's collecting things like atmospheres of pressure going to the analyzer. It collects the temperature of the gas cell because the temperature, and we've seen this before, if your temperature goes up substantially or down substantially, it's indicating one, not good health. So two, then it's from that lack of good health, if you're not paying attention, you won't pass your calibration. Sure, like, what the heck's going on? How come I'm not passing? This instrument used to be so good, but now it's trash. What's going on here? So, oh, it's because one thing, temperature's wrong. So how do you figure that out? You replace B and B boards, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's a nightmare. But luckily, we have all that stuff in the field with our guys anyway. And the, the, cool, the most other cool thing about this instrument, you can fix it on the fly, man. You can replace a laser beam in the parking lot of a Walmart. It's awesome. And they said, hey, you need an oscilloscope. You need this, that, and whatever. I was like, I don't have any of that stuff. All I have is an extra laser and I have some Allen wrenches. So I just, just, okay, I looked at it, took a picture of it, and I put it back as best as I could in the right spot. Did it get signal? No, I messed it up completely. But... I was able to fix it. You can change it and adjust it on the fly. It's great. I'm trying not to listen. <laughs> <laughs>
I told him it's a bad idea making me present. I told everybody that. I said, you don't want to do this. No, you don't want to put people in a room where I'm standing up and talking because no one's going to like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Test plan X1. This is all, you guys can read this yourselves, but basically it's saying, um, what am I sampling? How am I sampling it? Uh, what's the renderation? Uh, Pre-test prep, annex is four, five, and six. Uh, also required prior to testing. Um, annex four is the, the background. We do that over a minute and a half. You have to run nitrogen. Once you have a good zero. So the point of taking, a, taking the background it's eliminate initial noise because if you turn on your FTIR and you're flowing nitrogen or whatever, you're gonna have some either residual sample that could be in there, which is where you're gonna run the nitrogen to flush out the gas cell. You run the nitrogen in, so gases are flowing, you're like, okay, hey, this is looking good. It's all basically zero. But some people, if you're too new and you don't know what you're looking at, you're like, oh man, this looks great. But actually, you look at the propane or you look at some other um, analyte, because we have, I think, six different analytes you can look at at once with the software. So I mean, it gets the cycle through if, to make sure everything's zero. Because if you have uh, your NO number up, so like, oh man, NO looks good, but your NO2 is like negative, or it's a positive 10, and you hit the background, it says, at that point in time, when you hit background, it goes, this is zero. So that's the ultimate zero for the analyzer for the day. <clears throat> the other part of it is you check your max intensity and linearity, get to that in a second. Uh, this is the linearity check, and the reason that this is so vitally important with the FTIR, by comparison to a 7A or a 3A or a method 10 calibration, which are three-point calibrations. So those are all three-point calibrations. Is it you're in a zero, you're in a no mid gas, and you're in a no high or upscale gas, and you plot those on on a chart, and you have this in our report it just says, is this linear or not? If it's not, something's wrong. The analyzer's messed up, but if the gases hit where they should, then they also should, they should, then everything's linear. But the FTIR is a single point calibration. As in, you run in a specified level of CO, NO, propane, and that counts. It says, hey, this is plus or minus 0 0.005 right here. You just zoom in on it, plus or minus 0 0.005, bingo, we're at zero. So it's like, it's linear, period. It's going to hit all calibrations, all from zero to basically infinity. It's like it's, it is that awesome of a piece of equipment. Um, what other note? Yes. The single beam max intensity is another great check. So the, the check we just did was a zoomed in point right there, about negative 200, or sorry, 50 inverse centimeters, not negative. What am I saying? Negative. That would be negative. Um, 250 inverse centimeters is that measurement. And this is measured in volts. So what you're seeing here, you're saying, oh, what's my max intensity? You're like, why is that important? Anybody have any idea why this is important? No one? Any guesses? This is saying, how much laser am I getting through? Am I getting a lot of laser through? Is there, am I getting nothing through? Our, goal, our, our standard at bear is above one. Stay around above one. But realistically, the FTR is so great, even with the high, because this is such a high resolution piece of equipment, we've gotten down as low as 0.4 and still had every calibration pass, everything looks good, all of your numbers check out great. Um, but this shows you how much laser is getting through. And the way the laser works, it bounces back and forth in this gas cell, um, 5.1 meters. It bounces, 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 bounce, and it shoots through these um, potassium bromide, which are water soluble windows so that bounces off these gold fitted mirrors these potassium bromide um windows into the optics box and then bounces off more mirrors and it's a it's pretty pretty intense so there's some things you can do to, to increase your signal decrease all kinds of stuff it's just like literally like playing with an etch a sketch blind like this backwards it's horrible um but it is doable and you can do that in the field as well this is the water peak analysis. This is a very, very important check as well. You're comparing your, these two numbers. Are they close enough? Are they plus or minus 0 0.05 or whatever the number is? It's super, and also, hey, what's my laser frequency? But more than anything, you're like, hey, what am I looking at here? Am I under 0.55 on my full width half height? You're like, what's full width half height? It's the resolution of the instrument. 
So the resolution said the first picture was max intensity, shows you how much is coming through. And this says, how good is the picture of the message? So if that checks out, this checks out, you just keep on rolling through. Do your background, do all that other stuff. See the detail right here, look at that, fantastic resolution. Look at that, that's amazing. Can't be beat. Um, like legitimately, if it's under 0.5, you're just like, okay, let's just roll through these calibrations. How fast can we done with this? Because it's, this analyzer is just that robust and that awesome. One thing that's also very interesting with regard to the FTIR is legitimately you don't have to run calibration gases. You don't have to check your CO, your NO, your propane through the system, through the direct, through whatever. We do all that just to make sure everything looks good, everything's accurate, everything's as it should be. All you really have to do, if you're eth if you're on ethylene, it's the CTS, the calibration transfer standard for Annex 4. If you run through your ethylene gas and it hits within that 5%, you're good. I mean, that's it. That's it. You're done. It's like, this is great. I, I was ready to roll. The method does say technically to <clears throat> calibrate for target analytes. It is. Don't want to jump ahead. I'm sorry. It does say that as well, but you can make a very strong argument if this passes. It's recommended, but if you, if you can make a very strong argument that you don't have to run other guesses. Um, this is just an example of you know, some response times. There's some other things you have to do within the method, and I won't bore you with all that. But as long as your gas is hit within that plus or minus 5%, which we, of course, did, um, and it always does, also, your response times there with 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 the FTIR, there's no real use for response times other than saying, "Hey, do I have enough, enough sample coming in? Can I start my test?" Or you just look at it and say, "Have I equilibrated? Am I at an equilibrium of the ethylene gas level?" Uh, and this is where you do the calibrations. You pick your uh, analytes, and there's some surrogates that can be used. You use acetaldehyde for formaldehyde currently. But as it mentions right here, it is under review on the rewrite committee with this guy. He's on the FTR rewrite committee. I don't know how he got chosen and I didn't, but they picked him. I think he was begging to be put on there, but I'm not quite sure. Anyway, he's on the rewrite committee with way smarter people than us. PhD, super nerds, awesome. It's great to be part of, of, of that group uh, and also to be, to be able to, we share an office and listen to some of those conversations. Some big, big, like, big brain stuff. And I'm like, whoa, man, these guys are great. Um, <clears throat> but use propane as, as for all organics, as in propane counts for every single organic that you measure, um, methane, methane, propane, butane, all that. Uh, so well, you're saying like you're going to propane, but you rerun the data as well. What's your question again? You said that that, that, that one measured propane as well. Could you rerun the data? Well, so okay, so we use that as a calibration gas for VFCs, as in calibrating for all organics. But you, we can do anything. I mean, you can literally reprocess the data, add in stuff that, that no one even knows about, because most things have a spectral residual that you're measuring, which is crazy. Oxygen, not one. Water, yes. <clears throat> some examples of some calibrations. Um, this is a big one right here. Um, and the reason this is a big deal is it takes time. It's a time thief. And it's important because, well, we'll get to the time thief first. Eight samples. This minimum detectable, detectable concentration is done when you run a zero gas through the system. Let it equivalent, equip, equilibrate and talk to zero. Once it hits the zero, you say, that's a zero. Let's start the countdown. And you have to record these eight samples at the same time, at the same sample rate that you're going to be recording the test. Standard quad J, standard quad K, any of these tests that we do, state rating for tests, there are one-minute intervals. So that takes a minimum of eight minutes of running nitrogen through your system. So you're just blowing nitrogen through your system at zero. And the reason, and this has to be done every single day. I've seen other competitors where they say, Oh, we don't ever do this. We don't have to do this. It's per the method, you have to do this. Annex two, it's one through eight. So if you say you're only going to do annex one through seven, but you're not doing it on a daily basis. You can't use manufacturer specs. You can't use um, this. It's, the other thing is it's extremely variable. 
I mean, you're not going to have the same MDC. And the way it works is the MDC is calculated by three times the standard deviation, and that is the noise equivalent absorbance. So the standard deviation is the noise equivalent absorbance. Three times that is the MDC for your minimum detecting concentrations. Really, the most most important when you're talking about measuring very small levels, as in some parts per billion of formaldehyde and things like that, or if you have really tight limits where you're saying, okay, but but the real deal is this has to be done. And, and the thing is also you use this to uh, do your bias adjusted average because with an oxygen calibration with the 70, 10, 3A, 25A for um, for VOCs, you're measuring, you're doing your, your calibrations and you're adjusting it based off of whether or not it's a significant number, which it's not, what is this? Oh, this is, this is an example of some, Okay, is it done? It's done. Uh, no, it's not. I think it's just. Is it repeating? Repeats. Yeah. Or, or no, this was shown MDC runs over, I think, three or four days. It's just it's basically just showing that MDCs are different and, and, they, and they are variable. It's really difficult to see. It's, you can see better on this, this screen. So you're, same I mean, four, yeah, same four days in a tabular it's a, format. Yeah, this is a tabular format. The other one, so basically you're saying, okay, this is one day, this is another day, this is another day. And you can see, yeah, it's, it's pretty close to zero, but the numbers are not the same. Every single, not a single one of these numbers is the same as that. Well, actually close to zero. But it's the same day too. But so the thing is, you're having variability that you're not taking into account. Of. And also, it's not a necessarily a question of is this going to be a, the, the difference between me failing or passing the test? It's not that's not the question because more than likely it's not. You're talking minimal PPM um, adjustments for this bias adjusted average. So it's very minimal, but is it done right? Did you do it right? Did you do the MDC? Is it in your test report? Um, did you have a bias adjusted average? Because at the end of the, the test, you want accurate results precision and accuracy. If you're not bias adjusting it, whether or not it's one ppm or zero ppm or whatever, you're irrelevant. It's still, you have to do it the right way. Um, this is just a comparison between the two, the different dates, give the, uh, the 11th through the 14th. Um, you can see there's, there's the differences. And this is, again, standard deviation, three times that um, for the NBC, which has to, again, be done on a very regular basis. You see very minimal variability overall. You're talking about uh, half a ppm, but still it's real. And if I mean, that's just it, the, the thing that we try to do here at Bear is just to make sure that what we're doing is complete, accurate, tra transparent. Because if you don't have a complete report, if it's not transparent and easy for people to understand, or um, or just done properly, then you don't have anything at the end of the day at all, and that's not what we want. <coughs> Spike recovery. This one's fun. It involves this. The essence of the spike recovery is oops, here. Um, is to show improve your system can properly transport analytes of interest. Key thing is analytes of interest. For measuring formaldehyde, you can spike in acetaldehyde. And the other portion of this that's important is you have to have to understand that you need a tracer compound blended in with your other compounds. If it's not blended in, then you open yourself up for tons more of like certificates proving that things are, are in there or not in there. As in, do you have uh, your, is your flow, flow rates or your flow rates correct? Is your, is your dilution system working properly? How do you know that you're actually spiking in what you say you're spiking in for your dilution factor? And um, another thing that we've also noticed, you've seen some people spiking over that um, 0.1 or 1, 1 to 10 ratio. Uh, and typically, the way we do it, we've got a CO and O propane bottle mixed with SF6 sulfur hexafluoride, which is not part of the combustion process, which is why you use it as a tracer gas. Uh, and essentially, what you do is you pump in whatever percent, 0.9 percent of a bottle, just based off of rotometers and things like that. And you say, hey, how much did I get back? And in this situation, you can see the spike when when it, when the uh, and it starts spiking. What is SF6 right here? You see that's at 0.3 right there. So that's what you tell the spike has hit the system. You don't see it spike up, literally. So it's saying, hey, one, 
Am I getting the compounds back that I put in or am I not? And the answer is most definitely you are getting something back. But they're like, what the heck ratio is that? I don't even know what I'm looking at. Who knows? So you pull an injury up to your little table and you're like, bam. And the cool thing is with this, if the tolerance is super weak. You're talking about plus or minus 30%. So that takes in the and so one thing we have also noticed, so if it's like just like with the with the uh, strat checks, the pollutant stratification checks with rich burn engines. Oh no, my system's not working. No, it's not the system. It's the it is literally your your source is is stable. Everything's fine. Or the source is not stable. Everything else is fine. Your system's great. Everything's great. Your flow's great. But your but your system is it's looking like it's 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 fluctuating because your CO and your NOx are going all berserk on you. So when in doubt, collect more data. <clears throat> There's there's a, an example of a calibration gas certificate. Um, again, blended. And it says right here, if you look at this note right here, blended concentration allows reactive quantification with the exact exact dilution factor. So it negates having to calibrate mass flow meters, controllers, or road meters. If you have somebody that's that's not having, if you have gas certificates in your test report, one's an SF6 bottle over here, and then you got another bottle over there, whatever. Show me the certificates. Show me the money. Uh, because that's the thing. If you don't have it, then where, where's where's the data? Yeah, that is king. Uh, manual validation. This is the the final thing. A lot of people don't know what this is. A lot of people don't know why you do it. A lot of people don't do it. A lot of people do it incorrectly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were trained by um, this guy named Marty Sparks. He's here doing some other stuff. He was with Thermo Thermo Fisher Scientific. God, I can't talk. He's with them now. He used to be with Prism. Then they sold to Montrose. Once they sold to Montrose, a direct competitor of ours, we could not use them for our data validation purposes. So we were still trained by Marty and that, and that whole group of guys uh, on how to do this validation process properly. Um, and there's a couple key points it has to be done. Two points, two points per run. So you have to have six points of manual validations. And again, you're comparing the algorithm to the human eyeball. And that's, I mean, there's no way around it. And if you say, oh, this is a calibration gas that I ran to, that doesn't count because that's not a manual validation. You can say the ABU software screenshot counts. because That again is not a manual validation. You can say a bunch of different things, but if you don't have, and the only way to actually capture the information is with screenshots. So we're going to um, end up with those two sample points. Again, one's the high or an outlier, high or low. And one's the part closer to the average. Oh, this is a good one. Time lapse. You can't see it. it says up here. Time lapse. This is an actual method. So this is the manual validation. The pause this. The pause this. No. You might have to run it from here. No. Hold on. Hold on a second. Go back. Do this. Let's talk quickly. Two minutes. And you get 20 minutes. Ah, hey. <laughs> so the, the thing you look here, if you look there, first you have to load this the, the sample, which is this right here. So you actually go through and you load in a sample. And first thing you have to do is select your target compounds and you manually scale it. So literally someone's sitting by a computer screen clicking and dragging this nonsense. And what you're looking for is this point of equilibrium. And once you say it's like, oh, wait, I'm just gonna pause that. <clears throat> so what you're looking at, if with the trained eye, you say, okay, equally good. And so then you say, that's actually 600 PPM or 560 or whatever this number is right here. But it's actually telling you the PPM number and you're manually quantifying it. So you're like, oh, did I pass? Did I fail? And you don't know unless you're like back and forth looking and everything. But the way we have it set up, and, oh, the other thing is when you do do this, you have to do it in a specific order because you've got different analytes that are interference with other analytes. So if you try to go in straight ahead and do NO2 or your NO, you're not going to get any numbers, any garbage. And the reason is, it's because oxygen, not oxygen, but um, moisture is an interference. You've got methane that somehow someone interferes with it. So you're looking at all these different compounds. You're going through one by one until you've completed the entire process. You get the screenshots to prove that you've done it. You've got the data here as well. Over. So. Um, you've got the uh, at the end of it, you put it in a table. Do you have a table in here? We might have a table. We don't. Somebody might have a table. Um, 
essentially what it does is you say, OK, it pulls in from the spreadsheet. These are the automated values. And then we say this is what we saw through the naked human eye through the manual validation process. Again, two points per run outlier and average. Um, you have this ABU software, which is cool, but it doesn't do it does doesn't do manual validation. It's it's really interesting and cool because it shows like temperature and things like pressures. It shows that it will tell you Cranium is in good health, but it will not do manual validation. Um, there actually is a, a um, utility that did MKS develop that? Uh, or are they, are they still in the process? There's a separate, yeah. So um, through the Source Evaluation Society last last year, they had a webinar. Some of the states up north have said we would like to have the ability to do our own manual validation on the points that you have validated um, to see if they can either come up with the same results or similar results just to make sure that, hey, we, we can take a look at this. Now, the controversy there is you may be reporting for NOx, CO, VOCs, uh, perhaps for formaldehyde or, or whatever compound of interest that you're really looking for. Well, now the agency has spectral data that they can go and start looking at your methane numbers. You're processing data yeah. and pulling a bunch of nonsense that you don't want them to know about, essentially, is the gist of it. But that is, that is the general feel and the direction that, um, that we've seen some of the state agencies going towards, again, specifically up north, just so that they can do run their own validation analysis on, on the data sets that you're pulling. So they will, they have reached out to testing companies and said, well, they reached out to the um, FTIR manufacturers first and said, can you develop a tool that would allow us to do our own analysis? And, and so I know that MKS uh, did it. I don't know um, if Spectrum has done it. Um, I, I think, um, uh, GasMet was looking into it. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how far some of these other companies have gotten with this. Again, they started to say, why Why are we having to do this to, to prove? And so the idea is, hey, if you can at least put screen captures in your test report that show that you've done NXA in this validation process, that's been acceptable for, for most states. Um, and then there's other controversial points that Rob is probably going to cover here in a minute. In regards to this process, we're in the final stretch. We're almost to the questions. I think it's already asked a bunch of questions. Please ask more if you have some. This is this is these are some of the things we've seen other testing firms do that is not correct with regards to the ASTM 6348 method. And that was where I said earlier this NEA, this minimum min detectable concentration, the noise equivalent of absorbance, not doing it on a daily basis or just using a, a manufacturer spec across the board. And not even doing it. And the thing is, it's and the reality is, in that situation, if you're not doing that, you're not using that time. That means you can do, do more tests, you can operate a little bit more efficiently, use less cow gases, blah blah blah. But also, again, it's just not proper, which is also leads to the MDC not being done properly. That's again three times the NEA. So without proper MDC, not without proper NEA, then you didn't do that that portion of the method, which means you didn't do the method. Um, analyze spike. Uh, we've seen again some people with some questionable practices on us where we're like, hey, where's your calibrations, uh, certificates for your mass flow controllers, things like that. It's like, and of course, I don't, we don't know where that that ended up with, you know, because we've got both mutual clients and you know, hey, look at this report or whatever. You know, like, hey, this is, you need to ask for that. You know, I don't know if they've ever found the flow meter. I have no clue. But be on the lookout if you use people that are stack testing companies that um, have non mixed calibration gases, it, it could be a red flag. Well, it was a, it was a big question during the source evaluation uh, society webinar last year, and they're they're doing another one here in April that they're going to go over many of these topics again, just to ensure that the industry understands what what needs to be done when using this method. Again, as Rob said many times, FTIR analysis is very robust. It's an amazing instrument to use. The method is not as simple as some of the traditional methods for traditional analyzers where you're looking at NOx or CO or oxygen. Um, so there, and it's not an easy method to read either. Uh, it's very technical. Um, and, and so there's just a lot of gaps in understanding. And another, another point with like the complexity of this method versus other methods, 
uh, is one the black box theory as like what is this thing doing inside there because it's a lot of science a lot of like laser beams and futuristic stuff which is really cool liquid nitrogen could freeze gummy bears to throw them away down the shatter is really cool stuff but but the thing is it's not if you actually just take a step back and we, we dig digested this over a number of years and so we're able to talk through some of the stuff and one other thing is it's not sequential it doesn't go it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's like one, two, five, six, whatever. It's all out of control, which also lends itself for some confusion for anybody that's either using it or even a regulator trying to regulate it. Um, because and another another thing, interestingly enough, is this method's not available online. You can't just go, I'm going to go look at this method. It's you have to buy it, say 80 bucks or whatever. But if anybody wants to copy the method, um, uh, and Want any advice? We can we can certainly help you guys purchase that and um, make sure that everyone's well informed. Because again, that's our whole goal here is to one transparency, two education, um, and three be funny. Oh, whatever. Yeah. It's horrible. It's not yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good for baseball. <laughs> <laughs> not not that. All right.